So today we're going to be talking good. about, about uh, Power BI data quality checks using Python and SQL. So just a little bit about me. Uh, like Sue mentioned, I am a Microsoft MVP as of this year. So Sue and I got to join that club together, which is exciting. Yes. Uh, I am a solution architect over at P3 Adaptive. So definitely love working there. If you have any questions about what we do or if you want to listen to the podcast, it's called Raw Data. Yeah. I tune into it on Spotify, but I don't know see if you've listened to it elsewhere. But Sp Yeah, Spotify for me. Yeah, and they've got a website as well. So if yeah. you don't have Spotify, you can still listen to it for free. Um, I also co-organize the Lexington Data Group. So if you happen to be stateside and near Kentucky, feel free to hit me up. Definitely down to connect and grow our community in person as well as virtually. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a co-author on Data on Wheels, which is a blog that my dad started uh, about 10 years ago and uh, co-founder of Data on Rails. So if you are looking for a way to start blogging, feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help you out. We've got a platform that's made just for you. So, ah. yeah. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just a little shameless plug. I'm going to put these links into the Teams channel, mm -hmm. um, but we are raising money right now for ALS. So my dad has been in the IT for 20 plus years, and uh, we're going to be walking for raising funds for ALS. So this is our team. Um, this is the last week uh, of a big push to donate. So we're trying to raise an additional $1,000 this week. Um, obviously, anything helps, right? So if you are mm. willing to give even $5, that's huge, and we really appreciate it. Um, another option is to buy one of the t-shirts that my dad designed. So the, these shirts, 30% of the profits go toward that walk. So mm. if you're looking for a way to rep you know, our team, even from afar, you can walk with us. So feel free to join our team or donate, um, and I'll put those links in our chat as well. So let me do that before I forget. And that's my only shameless plug for the day, promise. Uh, it's so. a very worthy shameless plug. <laughs> you carry on. All right. Well, then uh, let me get back into the PowerPoint. Do, do, do. And then go ahead and play this again. And share screen. All right, there we go. It's always fun. I got a new monitor, Sue, and I'm loving it, but it is always fun to navigate how I want to do it with presenting. Yeah. So Appreciate we get very, very specific about how we want things. So I'm the same. Just click a yeah. button and expect it to be. Yeah. It's part of the OCD nature that makes us good at <laughs> our jobs, but difficult to be live with sometimes. <laughs> so true. Speaking mm. of difficult to live with, um, data quality, right? Uh, so what we're going to be talking about today. Shameless, is... <laughs> shameless, smooth link. Love it. I'm going to turn my uh, mic off now. <laughs> so data quality, um, the goal here is to build trust. So you might be thinking, why are we talking about data quality? If you're thinking that you've never run into an issue like we're going to talk about today. Um, Let's say, for example, that you have spent 40 hours, you know, a full week of work or maybe over the course of two or three weeks working on a report that you are really excited about, that the business has asked for. Um, and you've spent all these blood, sweat and tears hours and you go to publish it. And then you look at the usage report about a month later and you see absolutely nobody is using it. One of the main reasons why people don't use reports is they don't trust the report's data. So what might happen in that scenario is maybe you go to those users and you say, hey, why aren't you using that report? And maybe the head of finance comes to you and says, hey, that's because your numbers don't match what we're about to present in board meetings. So what you've presented on that screen is actually not useful to anybody who's trying to build reports for these really important meetings come up. Now, you might not know that ahead of time, right? You might not know that that's an issue, but now you have something that you need to now compare your report to in order to ensure it's going to be useful. So a couple of key points here. Uh, the key to useful reporting is adoption, right? If nobody's using it, why did you build it? 
um, we're not in the business of art, right? We're not trying to build things just so that they can sit and gather dust somewhere, right? We want them to be used. We want them to be looked at. Um, consistently incorrect data, it destroys the trust in the data and the report by extension. So what I mean by that is if you are consistently refreshing your data, you tell people it's really good to go, they look at it and it doesn't match, they're gonna have a really hard time trusting any other number that you put on that screen. You need to have trust with your stakeholders so that they feel that they can use your report to make business decisions. Uh, the quickest way to rebuild that trust is to automate data quality checks and demonstrate an ability to catch errors before they do, right? So this is a really big concept as far as app development goes or as far as deployment pipelines go. There have been really far advancements made in the case of DevOps where people are able to automate their data quality checks, right? I can check and see the number of rows in this table versus this table and make sure that my data is moving across as expected. Or maybe I know that a sum or a maximum of certain column should never go above maybe a million dollars. Then I should have a catch in there so that way if somebody fat fingers a number or if something gets you know, done wrong in my DevOps, it'll catch it for me before my business user will. So what we're gonna do today is try and build something similar in Power BI. So you might be thinking, why Python, right? Python's in the title of this, Python and SQL. So why are we using Python? It's simple, unlimited power, folks, unlimited power. I'll be honest, it is power I am still learning to tap myself. I would consider myself more of a Padawan than a, uh, than a Jedi Master or even a Sith Lord. But someday I hope to be at this level. Um, I, I think the only way we do that is through practice. So if you're looking into learning a new language and you're debating between SQL and Python, I will say this, if you are in the data analytics space, honestly, SQL is more useful to begin with, but you're going to learn Python. Now, I didn't believe that. I'm about five years into my data career and this is the first year I'm using Python. So if that puts it into perspective, I think Fabric is about to change a lot of that. I think we're all about to learn a lot more Python to use Fabric. So just be aware Python is really powerful. And for a lot of cases, it is the right tool to use, including this situation. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't need to learn Python because I got a team of data engineers. Well, hang on now. We're actually going to steal some things from data engineering. Like I mentioned, DevOps has had a long history of doing data quality checks and doing them really well. Um, one of the reasons for that is those data quality checks are scalable, they're automated. And if you wanted to, ideally we could put this data quality test into a table and then report on it later. So there's a lot of things in here that we can steal from data engineering best practices to make our own lives easier and to make our own work better, right? The goal is to always be improving just a little bit every day. This is something that we can implement as report designers to make things better. Now, I will call out, uh, Sue mentioned at the beginning of this call, you might have missed it. Uh, I did have this demo all prepared. It was all ready to go um, using an Excel file and Python on my laptop. And then I thought, you know, it'd be really fun is if I moved all that to Fabric. So I spent the better part of the morning, um, early morning, you know, obviously have a, a full time job as well, but working on rebuilding this demo inside of Fabric. Now, the old setup and the reason I call this an old setup is because this is what we're not going to do. I do have a very, very detailed blog post about how you can go through the steps to create the old demo. Um, I've even got in my GitHub a whole set of files that you can use. All that will still work. What that's going to require of you, though, is an Azure AD app in order to authenticate against Power BI REST APIs. You're also going to need to install Python on your own machine and add those libraries. And then you'll have to complete the Excel workbook setup. That one's pretty easy. It's basically hard. You have to hard code in um, a few of your credentials in the Excel version. So again, these are things that I didn't want to repeat with you guys since Fabric is something that we can use now. Um, so I'm going to show you guys the Fabric one, but just wanted you to be aware there is an end-to-end -end solution version of this or of this presentation. Um, I just get bored, you know, and so I, I 
mess myself up learning new things, but hopefully that we can learn some more things together. So the shiny new demo setup uh, <laughs> is going to require a fabric capacity. So I'm gonna briefly show you guys where you can find if you have one. Um, there are a lot of videos on how to create a fabric capacity. Uh, Chris Wagner and I have done quick videos on how to do this at the beginning of the year. Definitely recommend checking those out. It's much simpler than you think. Uh, the second thing we're going to do is add data to a Fabric Lake House, and then we're going to connect to that data from Fabric in Power BI Desktop. So again, some of this stuff might be new to you guys, so I'm going to take the time and walk through you guys, walk through that process. Um, and then after that, at the very end, we're going to have our notebook that is going to run our data quality check. Now, like I said, that notebook is slightly in progress. Uh, so I will be finishing that notebook and then publishing a blog on it with and uh, GitHub sources for that, but just wanted you to be aware that portion of the demo is not currently in my GitHub. So you guys are getting kind of bleeding edge of what Christina is learning at the moment. So hopefully we can we can help each other out there. Now to start off with, um, like I said, I'm gonna exit out of this PowerPoint in a second, but I wanna show you guys at a high level what we're gonna talk about. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're going to walk through how you would create a fabric capacity. Again, it's easier than you think. All you have to go to is portal.azure.com. Once you're in there, you can create a subscription. That is going to have all your payment details. And then from there, you'll create a resource group. That's just so it knows what to build things under. Again, some of this stuff is geared toward enterprise situations. Um, and then after that, you would create a fabric capacity. So we're not going to walk through all those steps today because that's not what the session is about. We're also not going to talk about pricing. Um, if you have questions about that, feel free to ping me. Happy to help outside of this conversation. The next thing we're going to do is add some data into Fabric. Now, there are a ton of ways to do this. There's notebooks, there's data flows, there's pipelines, there's event streams, there's shortcuts. But what we're going to do today is upload using a CSV file. One of the reasons I want to show you guys this is I feel like a lot of things that I look at don't cover how to set up a demo. So for example, if you are investigating Fabric for your organization and you want a quick proof of concept or you want a way where you can just see how it works, uploading files is a pretty low cost way to do that. Low cost in terms of time, right? Where you can just upload a CSV and be off to the races. So I just wanna show you guys briefly how to do that. It was something that I learned for this demo that I thought might be useful. Then from there, once we have our data uh, lake kind of set up with data, we're going to connect to it in Power BI. So I'll show you guys where to grab that connection string. And then I'm going to show you guys how we can connect to it using the Power BI SQL Server database connector. It's a little confusing right now because there is a whole section in the Power BI desktop under Get Data called Fabric, and all it has in it is data flows. So that might lead you to think that you can't connect to lake houses or you can't connect to warehouses, and that's just not true. So I'm gonna show you guys how we do that. All right, guys, now time for some live demos. <laughs> All right. We so like go, live demos. Right? Scary time, but it's gonna be good. It's gonna be great. It'll be good. Yeah. All righty, folks. So we are going to start off with our fabric capacity. So if you are like me and you're running this just on your own, I do want to show you guys just a couple quick things. So again, all you have to do is go to portal.azure.com. Once you're in there, um, if I go back to home, you can search in this resources up here for subscriptions or Microsoft Fabric. If you don't have a subscription, you'll have to make one. You have to have a subscription because that's how Microsoft knows how to bill you. So you have to put your credit card in there or if you have a business account, it goes in there, right? Um, once you have a subscription, it does require a resource group. Now, you might be thinking, why do I need a resource group? Uh, that's because you're going to be able to group multiple things in there underneath a subscription. Again, a lot of this is geared toward enterprise. I don't necessarily know that resources group resource groups make a ton of sense if it's just you, if it's just a one person shop. Um, but I found them handy if I ever need to bill like in an enterprise situation, if I've got things for maybe my finance department or uh, my sales department and it has to go against their budget specifically, that's where resource groups and tags come into handy. But for our scenario, you can just make a pretty quick resource group 
once you've got that stood up, all you have to do is come into Microsoft Fabric and hit create, and then you'll be able to make a capacity. Um, again, super easy stuff. It's just a certain number of requirements before you can do it that I just wanted to show you guys. If I were to hit create, uh, it just requires me to then, you know, pick which subscription I'm going to use, you know, if I want to use this subscription and what resource group I want it to fall under. Um, you can create a new resource group right from here. So if you're like, well, I don't really know even how to get that set up, this can kind of walk you through that process. So then you'll just create your capacity name. And then, like I said, you can skip ahead. You don't need tags. And then you'll basically just be able to review and create. So it's simpler than you think. Uh, again, I'm not going to walk through pricing at the moment. But if you're looking for a way to stand things up, it, it's pretty easy. I think there are also a number of trials still going on. So feel free to use a trial capacity for something like this. All right, with that said, I'm going to go into Fabric itself. Um, one thing that came out recently that is still relatively new, uh, I think it's still considered a preview, are folders inside of Fabric. So if you ever need to make a new folder, you should come up to new and hit a hit folder here. Um, I've made one just so we can limit our scope to what we're actually looking at in this demo. But just want to walk you guys through real quick uh, how I have a lake house here. So like I said, I just made a lake house. It is actually scary easy to make one. So if I were just to hit new, um, I'm currently in the data engineering persona. If I needed to switch that, I can come down to this lower left-hand corner and switch from Power BI to data engineering or vice versa. If I don't want to switch my persona, you can also just hit more options and everything is there for you. But to make a lake house, all you have to do is click this button and give it a name. That's it. And then you've made a lake house. It, it's a little crazy how easy it is. Um, I typically like to name my items with the actual item in kind of a prefix. So for example, I've got LH as my lake house. I've got NB as my notebook. The only exception I make to that is reports because in theory, those are business facing and I don't really want, you know, PBI, biking sales. I, I kind of want that to look more business friendly. So as I go into my lake house, uh, you'll notice that I've got a number of tables in here and you might have noticed this little symbol. So what this symbol means is that these are delta tables. What that means is that underneath the hood, it's got some files inside of it. So if I go to view files, it's going to show me the parquet file that is loaded into this table. Now, why does this matter? Why are we even talking about it? The only reason I bring it up is because because of Delta tables, we are able to time travel. Now, that is not going to be something I show in this demo, but it is something really important if you're looking at data quality. We're able to go back and see the past and see what the data looked like previously. Now, ideally, what you're doing in your architecture is some kind of raw zone that just has the raw parquet files. So if you need to roll back, you can. But just wanted to clear that up for you guys. That's part of why I like to use a lake house versus a warehouse. Now, how do we actually get data in here, right? You're like, oh, gosh, she's talking so much about things I don't care about. I just want to know about this data quality stuff. If I were to upload files, it's it's very simple. I just go to get data here and I hit upload files. And then it's just going to let me browse what's on my machine. And I can just pick any of these files. Now, I do recommend using a CSV because that's going to be the easiest way for it to convert it to a Delta table. So for example, I've got a bunch of CSV files in here. If I click on these three dots next to it, it'll let me just load to tables and I can load it to a new table or load it to an existing table. I mean, it doesn't get too much easier than that. Again, this is not a long-term solution. This is more of a, hey, I'm building a proof of concept or I don't have access to a SQL server. I've just got access to some data files. This is a really easy way to upload those. All right. Now you might be wondering, how do I get access to these tables inside of Power BI? Pretty easy again, I'm just gonna go up to this gear here. And inside here, I've got a SQL analytics endpoint. Now inside the SQL analytics endpoint, if I copy that, that's actually what I'm gonna use to connect in Power BI. So I've got my handy dandy little demo report. If I go to transform data, 
um, which is where I usually like to connect to data sources. It gives me a little more flexibility. Uh, you can also do this from get data here. You could also click on just SQL Server in the top ribbon there. But I'm going to go to new source and then SQL Server. And I'm just going to paste in that endpoint. Now, I personally am going to use import mode. Um, I know that there's a lot out there about direct link. We're not going to use that in this demo. Part of the reason is I think it's still a little bit confusing about when it falls back to direct query. So I have some hesitancies on using it, but it might really fit your use case. So if you are already using direct query, I highly recommend looking into direct link mode. Um, but go ahead and hit OK. Just want to show you guys what this looks like. So something that's interesting is that you'll notice I've got more in here than just the one lake house. So the way that Power BI is interpreting and, and how basically Fabric is going to work is your workspace is actually your server. So that connection string that I gave it is good for my entire workspace. Pretty cool. I can connect to anything inside my workspace I have access to. In this case, I have a warehouse that's already in there. I could connect to that. I know I want to connect to my lake house, though, so that's what I'm going to do. In here are a bunch of system managed views. Again, I'm going to ignore those for now but I could just pick one of my tables from in here or multiple at once. So kind of a neat way to grab your data from Fabric. Um, like I said, it's a lot easier than trying to spin up your own SQL Server. Um, and it can be a great way to test out Fabric for your, for your organization. So I'm going to hit cancel on that. These ones are already connected to Fabric um, using that string again. So I'm going to exit out of there. Any questions just, on how yeah, you would get that? Just fabric? a quick one. Yeah. Um, PPU or premium is required, isn't it, to get the SQL endpoint? Ah, yes. So, yeah. uh, and actually, because I'm using a fabric capacity, that's really what you need. Yeah. So, you'll need a fabric capacity, which yeah. is not PPU or premium. I'm really mm -hmm. hoping they come out with a like an FPU, you know, like a yeah. fabric per user, but. Until they do, the cheapest way to do this, honestly, is to have a pay-as-you-go and pause yeah. it. So yeah. if you guys noticed, I've got a tab up here that's just on my capacity. Before I end today, I will be hitting pause because okay. then I stop paying for it. So Okay. <laughs> that was another question from Fernando was why, why would you use the capacity, set up your own capacity instead of using the trial? Uh, there's no reason except that I don't want mine to go away if the trial period ends. So yeah. you totally so, can use the trial capacity. Yeah. Yeah. So out of question, just I know you're not going to talk pricing. How much would it cost you roughly to spin this up and turn it off? So on average for me, if I'm not presenting in a given month or I'm not working on a blog, it costs me zero dollars that month. Yeah. Um, if I am not, I think I had one time I forgot to turn it off. Big mistake. Um, but <laughs> if I go into I believe if I go the under subscriptions, cost management. So part of the nice thing about having everything under subscriptions is you're able to come in here and you can take a peek at what you spent. So, yeah nothing last month basically um right now i'm accruing some right so this will probably go up after today but mm -hmm. if i look at see the last three invoices yeah looks like the maximum i've spent in a month was twenty dollars perfect yeah i'm going to be talking to you later let me do this <laughs> yeah no problem and, and again, you, you could just use trial capacity. Fernando's totally mm, right. But like you, I don't want it to go away. Yeah. Well, mm. I think you can use the trial and then whenever it ends, which my concern is that it would end and I wouldn't notice. Yeah, um, I thought mine had gone and then not come back. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Which if it does go, you know, just uh, I hope you have the get stuff set up. But yeah, it's mm. another conversation. But yeah. <laughs> Um, right, I will, <laughs> I will let you carry on. <laughs> so they'll, they'll, they'll be going on at me for chatting. <laughs> Turn it off. Yes, yeah. So 
I'm going to go ahead and go back. Oh, yeah, and I think there was a, a question about the pricing. Yeah, this is just for an F2. So I think the trial capacities give you an F64. So that is another reason to use the trial capacity, right, is it's, it's free. I've got some benefits as an MVP. So yeah, so feel free to reach out. I can, I can tell you how to use those. Um, but the trial capacity is definitely great. All right, so now we have data we can access inside of Power BI. Um, we've got data that we can uh, pull in from that perspective. I have already published this, so I'm gonna go ahead and go back into our handy dandy Middle Earth. If I'm coming in here, I'm gonna go back to our notebook. So at this point, and I kind of wanted to cover this relatively quickly, right? There's a lot more we could go into. Um, just wanted to give you guys a high overview of how you would do this, especially since it's recorded and you can walk through it a little bit slower. Um, but at the heart of it, we've got data now. We've got data in Fabric in a lake house and we've also got it in a report. So the data quality check that we're gonna be doing is between the lake house and the report. So we'll see how far we get in the demo, but what I'm hoping to do is get far enough where we can change one of the files that we upload and we won't refresh it in Fabric in, in Power BI. And so in Power BI, that will be a mismatch, right? And that's what I'm hoping to show you guys. So we're gonna come into the notebook uh, yes, there is a question about the processes aren't running. So just so you guys know, capacity, if things are not running, but your capacity is not paused, you are still paying. Not paused means still paying. So just, just uh, answer that question. But yeah, all right. So let's go through um, this lovely notebook. It is still a work in progress. So I really appreciate your guys' patience with me. Um, but we did, I did get somewhere, I did get to some fun stuff. So I figured it was worth showing this instead of this uh, lovely, boring um, Excel workbook, right? So what I'm hoping to do is recreate this inside of a data frame. And the reason why I wanna do it in a data frame is that it gives us a lot of flexibility if we wanted to store those results somewhere else, right? So we could write that data frame into a table in the future. Um, data frames and me are not best friends, so I will be, We'll, we'll get to that point, but just wanted to show you guys how much easier things are now that we have the, uh, I think Senpai is the name, um, Senpi uh, library. So a couple of things to note, I've commented out this pip install semantic link. If you have not run this ever in your environment before, um, you're going to need to run this. So there are ways to do like if error kind of statements around this import senpai, but not a bad idea just to run this if you've got a new workspace that you're running stuff in. Um, I've just got it commented out again because it doesn't hurt anything just to have it there. Now you'll notice there are a lot of things that I've imported in here. Um, a lot of it we are going to use. I'd say that right now I'm not using the MS Spark utils, but I know that they can be really useful. So some things as far as Python goes, you can import without it being too overhead, too crazy, where you're going to be ruining your report or your uh, notebook if you add too much. So as far as I can tell, it's not a problem to add more than you're actually going to use. So the first thing that I had a question about was, hey, how do I actually run Power BI DAX measures from a Fabric notebook? Now, this is where that Tempi stuff comes in handy big time. Now, previously, if I had wanted to run a API from Power BI, in order to authenticate, I would have to give it a token. It can be super obnoxious to get the token. I'm just going to show you guys the old Python code real quick. So that way we get some appreciation. Um, if I go all the way back up, if we needed to authenticate for the Power BI URL, this is what we would have to run. We would have to have the OAuth token generated based on a client secret and a client ID. Those client secrets and IDs would have to be made from an Azure app. We'd have to post that API call and then get the bearer token and then pass that token into every single one of our other API calls. 
With SumPy, we don't have to do any of that. It is as simple as just calling the API that you actually want to call, which is kind of crazy. Um, so to start off with, I thought I'd go with evaluate measure. If you're as new to this as me, I do want to show you guys there is a really helpful uh, resource. Um, Microsoft Learn has come out with one, and I'll just put this into the chat as well. So inside of this, there are a number of calls that you can make that really mimic the REST APIs and go a step further in a lot of ways. So we've got ones like evaluate a measure. So if I've got a measure, I can have it call that for me and then give me back the results of that measure. We've also got evaluate DAX. So if you had been messing around with a DAX calculation or maybe you wanted it to return a table instead of just a value of a measure, you can use this in order to do that. Um, super cool stuff. We've got awesome things like listing the calculation items, you know, listing the gateways, hierarchies. There is all kinds of stuff in here that we're not going to touch today, but I just wanted to show you guys this is probably the best reference that I've seen to any of it so far. All right, with that said, let's actually evaluate a measure. So if you guys remember, the data set that I'm using is Biking Sales and Hobbiton. Um, I'm going to check my measure called cost in this current workspace. Now, something cool that I learned is that you can actually list multiple measures here instead of just one measure. Um, pretty neat. We're just going to call one for now. But what this is doing, and you know, if you wanted to, if you're thinking like me, what if somebody changes the name of my data set? What if somebody changes the name of the workspace? You can swap these for GUIs. So put a little note here can be swapped for GUIs. Why does that matter? Well, if we're using the Senpai uh, Fabric Library, what we could do is we could use that list uh, data sets function in there and get a list of all the data set IDs for this workspace. And we could run a similar check like this across everything all at once. So there are a lot of automation things that can come in handy here. Again, this is a really boiled down version of that just to show you guys the art of the possible. So with that, if I hit run, I'm gonna run this one first because I think I need a new session. Yep. So if you're using notebooks, typically the first time you run anything in there, it's going to start a session and that can take some time. So notice it said sessions starting and started in five seconds. Um, that means that of this 18, 19, 20 seconds of this actually running, a good chunk of that was actually just spent getting the resources to run this. So just be aware that sometimes notebooks can feel slower than they are going to be. Um, I'd also recommend if you are calling multiple notebooks at once, maybe through a pipeline, something that I've seen work really well is to actually call all those notebooks from one notebook because then you can share sessions uh, and it makes things run a lot faster. So just a little tidbit for you. But if I come in here, we can see that it ran and it gave me this beautiful cost value. Uh, this cost value is going to correspond to my actual, uh, my actual data set. So to test that out, I'm gonna come back to Power BI. We're gonna make a little page in here. Actually, we don't even have to do that because query view, so I'm gonna come over to DAX query view. And so I've got this, if you didn't have this already written, I just wanna show you guys how you can do this. If you're new to DAX query view, what this is gonna let me do is it's going to let me call DAX without having to create a visual. So it's a really great way to test variables, to test measures, um, to test things before you have to get it into a visual context. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna drag cost over here or you know what, actually, yeah, if I right click on costs and I go to quick queries, there are some options here like define and evaluate, define with references, or just evaluate. In our case, all I'm gonna do is evaluate it. It's gonna give me this 972 number, um, which is gonna take a little screen grab of that. And then we'll go back to here and let's just see what we got. So we've got 972, 579, 88, and then if I rounded, 07, perfect. That is exactly what I wanted to see. And that gives me good confidence that this is actually going to evaluate measures as I want them. 
All right. So coming back down, the next step is obviously, can I run this against SQL queries in my lake house? Uh, because I kind of want to know how I can call SQL from a notebook. So with that, what I'm going to show you guys is Spark SQL. Now, there are other ways to do this. Again, there's a million ways to do everything inside of Fabric. Um, you might have noticed over here in the right-hand corner of my cell, I've got this little PySpark Python here. I could change that to Spark SQL. I could change that to other languages in here. But if I change it to Spark SQL, one of the downsides is that then I have to do a little bit more manipulating and to, to get it into a data frame. So for our scenario, I'm going to keep using Python. And we're going to use a Spark SQL command in order to run a SQL script. So everything between the double quotes is going to be just standard SQL. One thing to note is that I've got this LH Hobbiton data. That is my lake house name. On the left-hand side in the Explorer here, I can actually see that I've got these resources attached. If you don't see those, what you can do is you can click Add Data Sources, and you can add lake houses here. So I could say, hey, I want to add an existing lake house. All the lake houses I have access to will pop up, and I can reference any of them inside of my notebook with, with one click. Now, if you're trying to remember this SQL later, like me, I never remember code the first time I write it, or maybe the 500th time I write it, but man, by the thousandth time I've got it. Um, what you can do is come into this lake house, and then let's say I just click on this aw underscore product. I can click on load data spark, and I can just click on that, and it will generate for me a new cell that just says, hey, select from that table that I selected. Super cool, uh, super fun way to have that pop up. You might have noticed I've just got mine as a limit 10. Um, yeah, and this is just putting it into a new data frame for you to run and see. So kind of cool. Uh, it's an easy way for if you forget something, it will generate the code for you. Now, something that Sue showed me that was also mind blowing is there's also a tool up here called Data Wrangler. If you were to click on this, it will find data frames that you have. Right now, we haven't run the other sales, so I've only got the one data frame that has the Power BI measure in it. But I could come in here, and for that data frame, I could get the Python that needs to be run in order to do certain things. So like, let's say I needed to find and replace. Um, I could say in my cost column, I want to find 100 and replace it with zero. It's now going to give me the code to do that. So just wanted to show you guys that. Sue just showed me that, and it was so cool. I was like, I got to show the, the group this as well if you guys haven't seen it. All right. So continuing on, um, how can we actually loop through a list of measures and, and query queries, SQL queries to check? Now. One of the ways that we can do this, and I'm sure there are more automated friendly ways to do this, but the way I could think of was to put it into a data frame. And right now it's hard coded. One thing that might be useful in the future if you were actually going to implement this is to have like a table that you have these checks loaded into with maybe the list of the measures you want to check or if you wanted to put your DAX query in there and then you've got your SQL query in another column. Pretty cool. Um, what we're going to do is just have these two columns in here to start out with. If I hit run, what's going to happen is it's just going to display this for us. I've only got two columns in here. I've just got my SQL query and my Power BI measure that I want to run. And these are going to reference the same thing, right? I want my SQL query and my Power BI measure to be the same. So what that means is typically it's going to be pretty simple SQL. If you have more complicated Power BI measures that you want to use as part of a data quality check, you will need to write the SQL that corresponds to it. So just be aware of that. Um, I'd almost recommend if you have really complicated measures, maybe do your data quality checks on something more simple, right? Like the simple basic building blocks that would throw off your measure. So just something to consider. We don't have to boil the ocean when we're doing data quality checks. All right, so I'm going to come down here. Um, and this is where the first loop happens. And this is going to be the bulk of what we cover today. So if you're new to Python, uh, you are in good company. I am also 
fairly new to Python. Uh, and what I've got in here is a for each loop. Now, what that means is it's going to grab all the records from my DF checker, which is my data frame that we just made. So it's going to grab all three of those records. And for every single row in there, it's going to run the script that I've got below it that's indented. Now, the indent is really important. If you add a space or you take away the indent, it will stop running in the loop. Um, so just be aware of that. Python is very case and space sensitive. So with that, um, I've got this current measure here. Now, what I'm going to do is actually comment out some of this so you guys can see this get built up. So let me just uh, come down here. If you're ever wondering how to vertically highlight inside of us, a, a, um, basically most Microsoft things, uh, like SSMS also will do this. It is just Shift and Alt. If you hold down Shift and Alt, you can vertically highlight. It is really nice for something like this. But what I want to do is instead of displaying the F checker, what we're actually going to display is our current measure. So you might be wondering, how did you figure this out? I'll tell you now, it's a lot of guess and check um, right now. But I think that there are some better programs for that. But at any rate, it gets us what we want. So I've got this for each loop. I've got current measure equals my row, and it's grabbing just the Power BI measure from the current row. So it's important, right, is to check and see, all right, we've got all three of my columns listed out. I've got cost, quantity ordered, and profit margin. And from there, what I'm going to do is run the script that we had before, and we're just going to grab the current measure, but through a loop. So kind of cool, you see like current measure, I've got that replacing what we had before. If I could scroll back up, we had cost hard-coded here before. Instead, I'm gonna replace that with our current measure variable. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this, but instead of displaying that, what I actually wanna display now is my DF Power BI. So again, these are all making data frames, um, which are gonna be really useful in the future because we can do a lot with data frames. So just something to keep in mind. I'm gonna go ahead and hit run cell. And now it's gonna give me three data frames instead of three values because I've told it to display the data frame for me. So if I come down here, the first one is my cost, the second one is my quantity ordered, and my third one is my profit margin. Sweet, so now I have my Power BI values without ever having to go into the semantic model myself. Um, it's already done for me. If I wanted to, I could load these into a table right now um, and be done with it, right? So that is one option. But I want to do a little bit more. You know, I kind of want to do most of the work in Python if I can. I kind of want to ship just one table to SQL. So in order to do that, what I'm going to do next is take these columns, like these data frames, and add them to our old one so that we can end up with something that looks like this, right? Where we've got a Power BI query column or our measure column, we've got the SQL query column, and then the results. So that's the final goal. So I'm gonna come back in here, and in order to do that, what we need to do is first, I'm gonna convert this into a Spark data frame because our DF checkers is a Spark data frame. And then from there, we're going to create a new column. Now you might be wondering, why do we need a new column? We have cost. If we compare the two data frames, so if I look at this one, right, it's just cost. Um, that's the only thing in there. If I go back to this data frame, I've got two other columns, Power BI measure and SQL query. What I need is for a column to join them on. And you might be thinking, why are you even bothering with joining? The reason is I actually want my cost value to show up in the same row as my cost Power BI measure. So the easiest way that I could think to do that is to add a column into the data frame that tells me what measure it is so I can join it on that with a left join. Yeah, it's a lot to think about, but I promise it does work. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. Um, and then we're gonna display our new data frame, Power BI. So at the end of that, what I'm expecting is to see a data frame that now has cost, and then I want a column called new measure that just says cost in it. 
Now, a trick, uh, a, a trap I fell into was I tried putting current measure in here. And so if you've ever made a new column inside of um, a data frame, a common uh, way to do that is using something like this, using the function um, and then column, and then you can put the value in here. The problem is if I do that, what happens is I get the cost value duplicated. So I get that 9725798 number in both columns, which is not what I want to join on. I will not tell you how long it took me to figure that out because it's slightly embarrassing. Um, but if you have run into similar things, you are not alone. So I'm going to go ahead and run this and we'll see if we get back what we're expecting. All right, so now I've got new measure and cost, new measure quantity ordered, and new measure profit margin. Great, this is exactly what I wanted. I wanted to be able to see what the measure was next to the value itself. All right, so what I'm going to do next is I'm going to grab my DF checker again. Um, there was a question about keeping the same name. Um, I'm never going to reference the Panda one again, so typically I will keep the same name for data frames if I have no use for the old one, just because I, I think it can clutter things up. So typically that's what I'll do. All right, so we've got a DF checker in here. Let's go ahead and display that once it's done. So basically what I've got coming up here is that left join that I talked to you guys about. So you'll notice we're calling our old data frame and then I'm going to join the new data frame on the Power BI measure equals new measure. So like I said, new measure column here says cost. If I were to scroll up, you'll notice that PBI measure also says quantity ordered or also says cost. So we'll get it in the right row. That's kind of the goal here. And then I want to drop our new measure column. So we're going to see if this works. I'm going to come into here and just display the final results. So we should only see um, comment this one out. We should only see one data frame at the end of this. So we go ahead and run this. All right, so we do. We only see one data frame and boom, we've got cost, quantity ordered, and profit margin as our columns. So pretty neat. Uh, we officially have all of our Power BI values. Now, right now, they're all in different columns. Um, again, this is not ideal. Now, this is something that Sue and I were trying to mess around with, was trying to figure out how to get rid of the space in my column headers. Uh, what I'm thinking of doing, and we'll run through the rest of this demo first and see how much time we have, but my plan is to actually make a column using my mistake that I had before. So basically, if I were to grab this, and let's just say that I have one um, that instead of is instead of grabbing the actual literal current measure, what I might do is do the replace function on just this variable. So something to consider. Again, these are these are problems for, for slightly future me. But what I'm going to do next is we're going to run our SQL queries, right? So don't think we forgot about those. Uh, it's a pretty similar thing. We're going to grab the SQL query from our current row, and then we're going to put it into another column. So from there, we'll be able to add it into our data frame. But for now, let's just see what these SQL queries look like. So we'll display our SQL query. Go. Run that one. All right, here we go. So this is one issue that I'm, I have to solve on my end. So you'll notice that we've got null here, and then we've got cost. We've got a quantity ordered came back properly, but profit margin and cost came back with nulls. You might be wondering why that is. Uh, the reason is when I created the CSV file and made it into a table, 
it assumed the wrong data types. So you might be wondering, how do you see that? Well, the easiest way to tell is if you were going back into the lake house, you can come in here and go to the SQL analytics endpoint. If I go to the SQL analytics endpoint, what that allows me to do all right, is make a SQL query that I can run and test things. So it stores the old queries that you've run underneath queries down here. Being a little bit of a bum, there we go. All right, if I hit run, it says, hey, you can't uh, use some with a varchar. You might be thinking, wait, why is it even making this a varchar? Well, if I go back into my data preview, so let's go to the lake house again, and I look at sales, it's gonna tell me the data types that it created. So you'll notice I've got number, 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 that's perfect, and then I get text. Why do I get text? because I have dollar signs and percent signs. So one thing to note, if you're not using a pipeline, it's not so smart. It's not so smart to change your data types for you. Um, I need to go back and edit my CSV files so that it can account for this. But just wanted to let you guys know that if you follow along in this demo and you're using you know, the same tables that I'm gonna be using, I will be correcting for this. But if you're uploading something on your own, just be aware you might run into issues with dollar signs and percent signs creating string data types. So again, not ideal and not something you can change without overwriting the table. So for the sake of time, we're not gonna override it too much because we're just gonna keep moving along. We have quantity ordered, so we can use that to do our difference once we get there. All right, so next up here is we are going to add in a DF checker. Um, let me go ahead and do that. So this is going to be similar to our other one. Basically, we've got a left join where we're grabbing our query column. So this is going to be the new query is the cost or the measure that we were using before. And we're going to join that back onto our DF checker data frame. Um, and then we're going to drop our new query column. Now, the reason why I keep dropping that column or the new measure column is because data frames don't love it if you've got multiple things in the same thing. It causes a lot of issues down the road. So we're just going to go ahead and drop it as part of the loop. So I'm going to go ahead and hit run. Oh, and probably be helpful to display that. So if we display our checker here, We've got a lot of columns, but we've also got a lot of data. So now I've got my order qu quantity ordered for both my Power BI and my SQL. Now you might have already noticed an issue here. We've got things that are named the same, right? That's because I've actually run this uh, two times now. And so it's, I'm gonna run this to clear up, clean up my, uh, my DF checker. This is where, Fernando, I think you made a good point where if I were to use a different data frame name, I wouldn't run into that issue and I could run this as many times as I needed and it would overwrite. But the benefit of doing it this way is, is now I'm able to see what's going on. So from here, I've got my cost and I've got my, uh, my quantity ordered. And you'll notice that these are the same. So we know that that would be okay. Now, this is where I think Sue, what time are we? I think we're done in a couple minutes, right? But it's, um, yeah, but it, I mean, oh, you've covered so much, so much. I know, oh, and I've got a hard stop, but hopefully this at least gets people. <laughs> we've got, we've got a few questions and conversation yeah, going on as well. Yeah, and but, we'll do questions. Yeah. 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 So what, what we can do is because I'm fascinated with this. I love a, I love a bit of Python and fabric and I hadn't <laughs> seen fabric MP. So, you know, you've inspired me to sort of uh, dust off Python and, and try again. So let's oh, yeah. let's set up a date where we can actually run through and play, you know, play with this. Um, oh, I'm so down too. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. So we're, you you have done also Fernando's intrigue and Christian Fifty said you also never heard something like a hard stop. <laughs> yes, I do. I, they're so rude to me, Chris, Christina. They told me that I don't know how to stop and I never turn my microphone off. So whilst you're presenting professionally, I'm getting uh, <laughs> getting grief. Oh, so that's helpful, why and re- helpful and respectful. Uh, so a- Adrian's made a couple of really good points. Um, it's, it's quite long, Adrian, but I love the fact that you're um, that you're. Um, it, can you see Adrian's chat? It's how to differentiate between the different data quality dimensions, you know, uniqueness, duplicates, et cetera. And it's useful to track in time the quality per quality role and entity to track the effort. How do you use the metadata from the data source or from the metadata repository to drive rules? Yeah, so a lot of that is better suited to uh, DevOps rules, right? Where when things are being loaded in. I think I think you might be conflating things just a little bit um, between the two, because I think what this one is gonna be focused on is just to Power BI. So yeah. I just wanna compare Power BI to this. Um, mm. I don't necessarily want to compare my, my gold layer to my silver or my silver to my bronze. Uh, you could do that using Python notebooks as well as SQL, right? Python notebooks can run SQL. The benefit yeah. of having them in a notebook is you can load it somewhere Reruns. else. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's that reproducibility, it can... isn't it? You Once you've got the code there, you call it DF, and then you yeah. can, you know, it's a lot easier to replicate it. 100%. Um, and Yuvi said, um, if you're interested in validating the metadata, then you could create the DMV table of the semantic model. And I said, I think this is more the art of the possible, checking that the measures are correct. So you're comparing the two, an easy way to compare the two. Um, so, you know, some some really um, yeah, and agents again circumcised against using Python other than SQL to check for data quality issues. And that's totally fine. You don't have to use yeah. Python, right? No. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Jack said he's glad that last comment was recorded. I'm not quite <laughs> sure which one that was, Jack. That could have been anything. <laughs> I think that might have been the hard stop one. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, probably. I do know. <laughs> to... <laughs> oh, dear. But oh, it's... turning off your mic. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I do turn it off, Jack, quite often. <laughs> Just a little bit, anyway. <laughs> that was absolutely awesome. You, so you, I'm not surprised because I expected it to be awesome, but I love listening to you. It's just brilliant. Well, so I am sorry we didn't get through all of it and that I don't have all of it in a, in a GitHub somewhere, but yeah, but it's work in progress. And I think all of yeah. us, uh, Fernando says when, and Christian says when, <laughs> <laughs> when will we do it? Uh, we'll talk, we'll talk. We'll let you guys know. I Before guess. Christmas, definitely. Maybe October ish <laughs> time. Should we do October? Yeah. We could Before do a joint fast. one, Christina. Why not? Yeah. yeah. Let's it'll do be it. it'll, it'll be raining by then. Then I get to hang out with you more often. <laughs> not so much swimming, yeah. Yeah, not so much swimming. Well, maybe. <laughs> we will. <laughs> so um a huge otherwise it looks good, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> I loved your input, Adrian. It was absolutely brilliant, and the fact that you were engaged and you commented. So you know, it and it makes you think, doesn't it? It really does make you think. But yeah, I'm looking forward to trying this out. So, um, and it's just lovely hanging out with you, Christina, again. Same, same. Yeah, I do have to run to another call, but this was okay. lovely. Thanks yes. for having me. <laughs> and say hello to say hello to Rob Colley, number one I fan. Will. Yeah. All right. I will so don't you worry. Yeah. <laughs> you're not okay. careful. You're gonna end up on that podcast yourself, you know. Yeah, he's not asked me. Does he not know not how yet. famous I am yet? <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't be able to get a word in edgeways, that's why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd have to turn off the microphone, Jack. <laughs> anyway, I will let you go. Take care, everyone, and thank you so much, Christina. Take care. Thanks for all. Having me. Bye. I'll stop recording now.
Bye. Bye. Okay, thank you.